It's a joy to be together as God's people, and I believe the scriptures are clear and our experience tells us that we're made for community. And so those that are gathering as God's people online, some of you are in your homes traveling and you're watching online, God bless you. We're together as a family. Uh, those of you that are out in the courtyard worshiping there, we're so glad you're with us, and God bless you as you worship. Uh, there's a number of families in the family worship venue. God bless you there and here in the worship center. What a joy to be together. Like, we're made for community. We're made for fellowship. And even in this challenging time where there's a lot of stuff going on, we need to continue to strive. For some of you, it took all you could just to get online and to be sitting where you are right now, to be here in the courtyard or to be here in the worship center or in the family worship venue. But, but God bless you for making that commitment to be together. And I believe that God is glorified and that we're edified, that we're made more like Jesus because we've been together. Well, we're in this series called The Forgotten Art. And we're talking about different things that are kind of part of our world that seem to be fading or, or that we need to pay attention to and try to, especially as followers of Jesus, uh, reclaim and bring back. And as I thought about that, uh, we're talking today about The Forgotten Art of acceptance. The forgotten art of acceptance. We are in a polarized, divided, conflicted time. And acceptance is kind of hard to find these days in our world, but I believe God has a message for us. And as I was thinking about this, my mind went back to a letter I wrote to my dad over 20 years ago. I'd been a Christian for quite some time. I was walking with Jesus, and I actually, I was a pastor and I wrote a letter to my dad. At the time, my dad was sort of somewhere between an atheist and an agnostic. He was sort of between, there's not a God, or I'm not sure if there's a God. He was kind of in that place in his journey. And, and so I wrote him a letter. And in the letter, all I did was I listed all the ways that God had used him to prepare me to be a pastor. And I started by saying, Dad, I know you had no intention of preparing your son to be a pastor. Uh, my dad raised, and my dad and mom raised us five kids really in a, with an atheistic worldview. But I said, Dad, here's the ways that you lived and you and Mom lived and the way our home was that actually showed me things about Jesus and showed me things about how to be a pastor. Even though you didn't intend it, this is what, how God used you. And as I was thinking about that, one of the things that my dad and Mom modeled for us kids, and again, they weren't Christians, but th this lost art of acceptance, it's kind of the way that the world was more like this years ago, is that my parents were very accepting of people who were different than them. My, parent, my parents uh, were, were fine with having conversations with people they disagreed with. And brace yourself. They'd have conversations with people, with people they disagreed with, and they didn't hate them. They didn't say horrible things about them. They were actually friends. I, one time, we had a, a guy who was a pastor in training. A guy who was mentoring to become a pastor, Adam Barr. Adam's preached here since he now, he now pastors a church called Inheritance Church in Grand Rapids. He's a great leader. And Adam was sort of being mentored to become a pastor, so I brought him with me for a conference out in California. At the time, I was pastoring a church in Michigan. He came out with me to this conference in California. We went to my parents' house and spent a day there with my family. And we sat in the living room before dinner one, one, this afternoon, and we sat for three hours and debated and argued, and talked, and went back and forth with each other. And, and, and Adam just kind of sat there watching our family members say things like, I couldn't disagree with you more. I think you're completely out of line. Uh, well, well, what I think is, and, and it was fiery, and it was intense, and it was my family. This is how my family has always been. And, and, and he listened to this for three hours. He didn't say much. And he's a bright guy. He's a brilliant guy, but he just kind of watched this. And then about three hours into it, my dad says, hey, Let's all go to Don Jose's for dinner. We packed in our cars, head up, and so Adam's riding with me over to Don Jose's, and I'm, I'm driving, and he says to me, hey, I gotta ask you something. Is that normal in your family? That people like, just like, disagree and go after it and defend their position and say, I think you're wrong? I said, oh yeah, absolutely. And then we went for dinner, I had a great time, and he watched and he realized we all love each other. You know, at the time, I was a believer, and my parents weren't, so we would debate about theology, we would debate about beliefs, I'd say, I believe God's really, so why don't, and we just had those, we didn't hate each other, we loved each other, we just had really, you know, lively conversations about stuff, and we defended our position, and that, that's 
the family I grew up in. So Adam kind of watched that. And it was a different thing. He grew up in a pastor's home, in a Christian home, but he hadn't seen that kind of openness and honesty with still loving each other, accepting each other. I shared this before, but it, it bears repeating because of the culture we're in right now. Um, the home I grew up in, my mom was the president of the Teachers Association of the public schools in the Orange County area where, where he lived. And my mom was a pretty strong, articulate Democrat. And she had certain views of, views of things. My dad worked for Hughes and for Lockheed, worked in the aerospace industry. And my dad was a small government conservative Republican. And my parents had very different views. They loved each other. They didn't hate each other. They stayed married for over 50 years until my mom passed away. And there's nothing that was tougher for my dad than watching my mom pass away. He loved her. They disagreed strongly on numerous things. And it was always, it was always funny, when they go off to vote, my dad, my dad would always say, make a comment to his kids. He'd say, hey, we're heading off to cancel each other's votes. And he meant it. <laughs> they were like, they were a net zero. They knew that by the time they got done voting, it would make no difference because they voted the opposite of each other. But they believed in voting. They believed in that right. They, they, they lived it out. But they knew that that result was zero. And our world has changed especially in the last couple of years. Have you noticed it? Oh, you disagree with me? I hate you. <laughs> but we're family. It doesn't matter. We can't disagree. We can't, we can't have different perspectives. And the idea of accepting somebody and loving them where they're at it, it has fallen on hard times. And so as we think about this forgotten art of, of, of acceptance, uh, what does it mean to, to live a life of acceptance? And what does it mean for a follower of Jesus? If you're a Christian, you're supposed to live like Jesus. If you're not yet a Christian, and we always have lots of people at Shoreline online on our campus that are trying to figure out the Jesus thing. They're not yet a Christian, but they're checking it out. If you become a Christian, it actually means you need to live like Jesus. That's what being a Christian is. It's becoming more and more like Jesus. And Jesus was incredibly accepting. Now, in our world today, when you use any word, you're, good, you're probably wise to define what you're talking about because everybody says, well, that's not the way I see that word. I want to be clear what I mean by acceptance, all right? When we talk about the forgotten art of acceptance, here's what I mean by acceptance. It's loving someone and welcoming them in to your life, welcoming them into your heart, maybe welcoming them into your home, even when you disagree on things. Acceptance is, is, is loving people and welcoming them in even when you disagree. Now, let me be clear. Acceptance is not affirming that everything they believe you agree with. You can accept somebody and not affirm what they believe. Acceptance is not approving of everything they do. Acceptance is saying, I'll love you even though we have a different view of things. And, and, and that's the heart of Jesus. And so we're going to walk through this, this kind of this, these five movements that, we, that we're walking through each week about the, the, this lost art here this week about acceptance. I invite you to open your Bibles, whether it's on your phone or on your tablet or in, your, in a paper Bible, to open to the Gospel of John, chapters 3 and 4. And the Gospel of John chapters 3 and 4, there's these two different stories that are fascinating. In John chapter 3, it's Jesus interacting with somebody very different than him, somebody he disagreed with on things, but Jesus was accepting of him, and that was Nicodemus. In chapter 4, a very different person, a woman at a well in the city of Samaria. And so we're going to look together at God's Word. We can't go into depth into both chapters because it would take multiple Sundays to get to, but I want to just kind of look at part of each of these chapters and get a sense of how Jesus is interacting with each of these very, very different people. So John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we meet this guy named Nicodemus. Now there was a Pharisee, that's a certain group, a religious group of people in those days of real authority and real power in the ancient world, a Jewish person. There was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. That's the Sanhedrin. That was actually the ancient Jewish Supreme Court. So this guy's a big deal. This guy is a smart guy. He's a thinker. He's influential. Verse 2. He came to Jesus at night. In the original language there, that, should be, that, that really means under the cloak of night, under the cover. He came at night because he didn't really want to be seen as somebody going to be with Jesus because there was some contention between what Jesus was teaching and what the Pharisees believed. He came to Jesus at night, and he said, Rabbi which means teacher, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can perform the signs you are doing, the miracles you're doing, if God were not with him. Now look at verse 3, Jesus' response. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, 
No one can see the kingdom of God. This is a religious leader, right? No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. That's where Christians get that term, a born-again Christian. Jesus says to this religious leader, influential religious leader, you can't see the kingdom of God until you are born again. So Nicodemus responds. And understand, he responds like a rabbi would respond. If you've ever I had a chance to be along the Western Wall in Jerusalem and watch rabbis and watch people, that, 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 I mean, you want to talk about vigorous debate. You want to talk about fiery discussion. You know, and, and in the ancient world, the rabbis would love to take things and turn them around and upside down and inside out and ask questions and challenge. So Jesus says, you must be born again. So Nicodemus, like a rabbi, says, wait a minute, born again? So he says this, how can someone be born when they're old? Nicodemus asked, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Rick Alexander, OBGYN over here. Can a full-grown adult enter to their mother's womb and be born again? The answer is no. And so, so, but Nicodemus is saying, he's, he's saying, you're not saying that, are you? It's not that he's stupid. He's being rabbinical. He's, he's saying, are you, are you saying that? So Jesus straightens it out. Verse 5. Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water, physical birth, and the spirit, spiritual birth. Flesh gives birth to flesh, physical birth, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit, spiritual birth. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. So Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. They're having a, 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 a really kind of a, a strong theological conversation. Rabbi and rabbi having this conversation. This is the part of the Bible, shortly after this, where we read these words in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus encounters Nicodemus. Nic Nicodemus searches him out. He finds him. And they have this conversation. Now, Nicodemus is a Jewish leader. He's powerful. He's, he, in, in that position, he would be wealthy, influential, righteous, quotes, in the eyes of the world, a righteous person, a religious leader, right? And he's a man in a world where men had a certain role and a certain, certain privileges. So Nicodemus kind of had it all together. But I want you to notice something as Jesus interacts with him. Jesus clearly cared about Nicodemus. You can see it in this encounter. His heart went out to him. Because Jesus looked at Nicodemus, and here's the reality. Jesus didn't agree with Nicodemus' theology, how he saw things. He didn't agree with Nicodemus' lifestyle, how he was, he was religious, but he was misled. But Jesus accepted him. He welcomed him in with open arms and open heart. That's the heart of Jesus. He met Nicodemus right where he was. He didn't say, Nicodemus, come on my terms. He said, Nicodemus, I'll meet you on your terms. That's what Jesus does. He had a clear love and a care for Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, we know, came to put his faith in Jesus Christ. Because if you go to the Passion narrative, at the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, the ascension, Nicodemus is back again, shows up again in the gospel narratives. And we see Nicodemus has become a follower of Jesus. So here's what I want you to hear, and please hear this. Jesus did not affirm what Nicodemus believed. He did not approve of how Nicodemus lived. But he welcomed and accepted Nicodemus right where he was at. Did you get that? He, he didn't affirm and say, I agree with your thinking theologically. He disagreed, and they had a conversation about it. He actually said to him, you think you're super religious? Guess what? You've got to be born again. You've got to start all over again. It's quite a challenge. But I want you to imagine something. Imagine Nicodemus came to Jesus. And he starts, you know, at night, he's coming to Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, time out. Jesus says, you're one of those Pharisees. You're one of those guys that's going to put me on the cross. You're the enemy. Get out, get away from me. Get out of here. You know, you're the enemy. Get away from me. Could you imagine that? No. But isn't that how people function today? Well, you're a different view than me. Get away from me. You're the enemy. There's people in families right now that won't talk to each other. Because they have different perspectives on things. You don't have to agree with what somebody thinks. You don't have to uh, affirm the way that they're living. But you can accept them right where they are and love them even when you don't agree with everything that they believe. 
But that's, being, that's a lost art in our world today. And it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And when Christians get swept up into this, man, when we as followers of Jesus start to look at people and say, you're different. You're on the other side of this, 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 com- this medical conversation, this political conversation, this social conversation. You see things different than me. Then get away from me. You're the enemy. Man, th- can I say something? That comes straight from the pit of hell and from the heart of Satan. That's where that comes from. And when we get swept into it as Christians, we're not living out the heart of Jesus. And, and so here's Nicodemus, and, and, and Jesus calls him to change. He lets him, he lets him come close. He accepts him, doesn't agree, doesn't affirm, doesn't say everything's right, but he loves him. Now, turn to John chapter 4. And here's what's fascinating about what happens. It's a whole different story and a whole different person from a whole different background with plenty of things that Jesus, as a Jewish rabbi, would disagree with. But Jesus accepts this woman just like he accepted Nicodemus. So look with me at John chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, and we'll walk through verse 10. Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. Put the pause button on there for a second. When it says he had to go through Samaria, if a Jewish person had to travel through the land of Samaria to get somewhere, it says they had to because in the ancient world there was so much tension between the Jews and the Samaritans that for a Jew to walk on Samaritan soil and get the dirt of Samaria on their sandals was offensive. That's the kind of tension there was between Jews and Samaritans. But they went through Samaria. Now he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar. Near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. This is some of the Old Testament kind of happenings, giving you some background there. Verse 6, Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. Now, at noon, no one comes to the well. They come in the morning when it's cool. They come to the evening when it's cool. Not in the heat of the day in a desert area. But, look at verse 7. When a, woman, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, she was coming to draw water because she was an outcast in her own society. She was on the margins. She didn't want to meet anybody because she knew what everyone thought about her because they knew her story and her history. So she came to draw water. Jesus said to her, <clears throat> he says, will you give me a drink? He asked a favor of her. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. They'd gone to go shopping. Jesus is there alone. Verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, she said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? This is unthinkable to her. Jews didn't talk to Samaritans. A lot of times in public, men wouldn't talk to women in public, and a Jewish rabbi would certainly not talk with a woman about theology and deep things of faith in public, and certainly not a Samaritan woman. So Jesus is breaking all kinds of rules. He's accepting one, a person who would have felt that she would be unacceptable to him. And he, he says, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And then kind of parenthetically, for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, and this is powerful. <clears throat> if you know what he's saying here, this is powerful. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. What's Jesus saying? He's saying to this woman, if you knew me, I mean, if, you, if you really, really knew me, you, a, a Samaritan woman, would have come to me, a Jewish rabbi, and you would have asked me to do you a favor. Absolutely unheard of. But Jesus wants her to understand who he is. And, and then, <clears throat> then the passage goes on. They have this incredible theological conversation. They talk about worship and the right place to worship. The Samaritans thought that Mount Gerizim was the high place of worship. That's the right place. The Jews said, well, Mount Zion is the high place. That's the right place. They talk about that, and they talk about that debate. They talk about what true worship is. The true worship is in spirit and in truth. And they just kind of go back and forth and have this incredible conversation. And, and, then, and then Jesus says to her, hey, I'd, I'd like to meet your husband. Now, he knows her whole story. He's Jesus. He knows all about her, and he loves her. He embraces her. He accepts her right where she's at. He says, I'd, I'd like to meet your husband. And she says, she says, well, I don't have a husband. And here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, you're right to say you don't have a husband. 
Because you know what? She'd had a husband, it didn't work out. A husband, it didn't work out. A husband, it didn't work out. Husband, it didn't work out. Husband, it didn't work out. And now she's living with a guy. So Jesus says, it's right that you say you, you don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with right now is not your husband. Then they have a conversation about the Messiah. She says, that, you know, the, the, the Messiah is going to come, and he'll, he'll straighten all this out. And Jesus says, you're looking at him. The one who's speaking to you, it's me. And then this woman, she runs back into the town to all the people that she had avoided. This is why she's at the, at the well at noon. She doesn't want to be around the women of, of the town who come in the morning or the evening because she knows how they see her and she knows how she feels about herself. She goes back to town and she tells everybody, come and meet a man who told me everything about me. He knows everything I've ever done. Can you hear it in her voice? I met somebody who knows everything about me. And he accepts me. He welcomed me. He told me if I would have asked him, he would have served me living water that wells up to eternal life. Could this be the Messiah? I think what she's saying is, I, I get it, he is, but could this be, could you want? And then many of them came to believe, then they came out, and met Jesus, and many of them believed that they met Jesus, and then he stayed for a couple of days and had a little revival meeting. Can you imagine if when this woman came to the well, and there sits Jesus, the disciples have gone to get some food, he's sitting by the well, and this woman comes to the well, and as she's walking to the well, Jesus says, hey, time out! You're a woman, and I'm a man, stay away. You're a Samaritan, I'm a Jew, stay away. I'm a rabbi. You're a sinful woman. Get away from me. Divisions pushing apart. I, I, can't, I can't accept you. I know your story. I know your mix-up. Could you imagine Jesus doing that? No. There's no one here, there's nobody listening online that would say, I can see the Jesus of the Bible treating anyone like that. Then why, if we are his followers, can we be sucked into that kind of thinking? Why, if we're his followers... Can we look at somebody and say, I disagree with you on that, therefore, you are a non-person to me. This is happening in our world in, in, in growing measure. The, the, the dividing of people by groups and categories and who's for who and the division of people is breaking the heart of God. And when the people of Jesus get sucked into that, we're walking a path we shouldn't be walking. And if you're not yet a Christian and you become a Christian, part of the journey of being, here, here's what it means to be a Christian. You ready? To be more and more like Jesus with every passing day. That's what a Christian is. That's who we are. And if we look at Jesus and how we, here's Nicodemus. Jesus didn't agree with Nicodemus' belief system. He wanted him to change. Jesus didn't believe the way that Nicodemus was living was right, but he accepted him. Jesus didn't agree with this woman's belief system. She didn't believe she was living, he didn't, Jesus didn't believe she was living the right way, but he opened his arms and his heart to her. That's what Christians do. And if Jesus would have, would have responded like, like our culture is right now, well, you're different. I see you, you, you think differently. You act differently. I don't agree with you. I'm disconnected from you. And what an opportunity for God's people in our world where everyone's getting more and more and more divided, more and more angry, more and more intense about these things. What an opportunity for us to be the ones who say, my arms are open. My heart is open. My home is open. Our church is open. We don't have to agree with how we see things. We don't have to agree with how we live, how we should live a life. Our starting point is saying, I can love you and accept you where you are. And that has fallen on hard, hard times in our world. And I believe it breaks the heart of Jesus. And so a question for you. Do you see the accepting heart of God for lost and broken people like us. Jesus is the master artist. He is God, Emmanuel, God with us. And he has o an open heart and open arms to, to, to a woman at a well, to Nicodemus, and to you and to me. I came to Jesus broken and, and not, my thinking was all wrong, my lifestyle was all wrong, and Jesus said, just, just come to me. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light, my arms are open. That's the heart of Jesus. That needs to be our heart. I had a, a young man, he was in his kind of middle 30s, came to Shoreline a number of years back. I had a chance to talk with him about Jesus. A number of people were talking with him about Jesus. He was open, he was curious. Like a lot of people who come to Shoreline, he wasn't a Christian, but he was kind of like, I want to understand the whole Christianity thing, and he felt safe being here, figuring it out. 
And when he finally came to understand who Jesus was, his death on the cross, his resurrection, he finally gave his heart to Jesus and received Jesus. It was an amazing day. But the day that he received Jesus, he actually looked at me and said, now I'm a Christian now, I'm a different person. But he said, I want to say something. I don't think that I would probably be welcome in your church. And I said, why? He says, because my back, my history. I said, what's your history? And he, was, you know, he didn't want to say it. But he said, I just don't know if I'd be welcome. I said, what's your history? He said, well, he said, for a lot of years in my younger life, he said, I was a white supremacist. And I was in a white supremacist group. And he said, not only that, I was a writer. So I've got all kinds of articles. They're out there on the internet. And there's no way I can purge them. And if you search my name, you would find things I'd written. He said, I don't believe it anymore. I don't think that way anymore. But that's who I was. But I'm not that person anymore. Now I'm, now I'm a Christian. But I don't think your church would want me there if they knew who I really am. What would you have said to him? Would you have said, oh, no. Shoreline will welcome you. They know you're not that person anymore. See, we live, we live in a world now where if somebody drags up a tweet that someone wrote 20 years ago when they were a dumb teenager not thinking about things, they can be canceled. They can be excluded. They can be, oh, now you're a non-person because of that thing you said 20 years ago. And he was just saying to me before, this is before all of the kind of stuff we have in our world now where everybody can, you can just be in trouble for one thing you said one time. He said, no, this wasn't just one thing. This is who I was. There's articles. There's all, and I actually went and looked and they were, I read some of these articles. They were pretty foul. They're horrible. But that's not who he was anymore. You know what I said to him? I said to him, you would absolutely be welcome at Shoreline Church. That's not who you are anymore. And I, actually, I asked him a question. Have you ever heard of a guy named the Apostle Paul? He said, no. I said, let me tell you about him. So he's the guy in the Bible who was killing Christians and destroying churches. His name was Saul. He hated Christians. He hated that he was literally killing Christians and giving approval for Christians to be executed and destroying churches, and he met Jesus. I said, not only did he become part of the church, he wrote more books in the New Testament of the Bible than any other person. You know what the guy said? He said, i got to learn more about this guy. <laughs> He's like, you mean there's a God who could take a murderer of Christians and a destroyer of churches and make him a leader in the church? That's the God we worship. He accepts a woman at a well. He accept, accepts the wealthy, religious, but misguided Nicodemus. He accepts Saul and makes him Paul. He accepts this guy who was a white supremacist and now has his heart changed and follows Jesus. He accepted a hard-hearted high school kid who wanted nothing to do with Jesus, but God changed him. And he accepted you if you're a Christian. How can we do any less? You following me? Do we understand the grace of Jesus? He's the master artist. He paints a picture for us to see and then for us to follow. So movement two, the forgotten art. Things have changed. Things have changed rapidly. Things are changing rapidly in our world right now. And, and, and there, there's, you know, people, people used to sort of be just generally optimistic and, you know, they'd, they'd trust people and, and they'd, they'd invite people in quicker than we do now. Even from a year ago to now. How quickly people can be canceled, how quickly people can, people can find out something, and all of a sudden, they're excluded. They're on the inside, now they're on the outside. It's, just, it's almost mind-numbing how fast things go in our world. And, and I've asked people in this church, and people I know that are, that are part of other Christian churches, what is this environment like for you? What are you experiencing? And I have people say, oh, it's just so hard, the division, the conflict, the anger, the bitterness, the fear that people have. And Satan just delights when we, as God's people, get sucked into it. Because if followers of Jesus can't remember that they were accepted as they are and accept other people as they are, who's going to do that? Who's going who's to do that? And can I say, if right now, if in your heart, you're thinking about certain people or groups or whatever, and you feel bitter towards and angry, and, and even right now you're just trying to build up a resistance to, to I don't, I don't want to hear this, I don't want to hear this, I want to nurture that frustration, anger, separation, just soften your, if you're a follower of Jesus, say, Spirit of God, soften my heart. Soften my heart. You might be able to say, I, I don't affirm what that person believes. I don't approve of how they live, but I can accept them right where they are because that's where God met me. That's how Jesus lived, and I'm supposed to be like Jesus. So here's a question for you. Can you ask God to help you see people as people and not as a group, not, as their, not by their external appearance, not by their worldly status or their personal background? Can you say, God, 
Help me see people as people loved by you, people made by you. And in some cases, I may strongly disagree with how they think and how they live, but Lord, help me see them the way that you see them. This, is, this lost art can be reclaimed by Christians who understand that God sees people differently. And then movement three, the picture is marred. There's things that have happened along the way, and, and, and it seems right now it's getting more and more intense. I, I need to tell you, as a pastor, um, I've never, I've been a pastor for the majority of my life and most of my adult life. I have never lived in a time like this where there is so much antagonism and so much hostility. I have talked with Christians who, are, who, who have been part of this church who, who would look at me and say, you know, Pastor Kevin, I agree, you, know, you and I agree on 95% of the things we believe, but these three or four or 5% we disagree on, I don't like you anymore, you can't be my pastor, and I'm leaving this church. It's like, wow. We have, we have so much in common, and yet there's, the, there's, the, there's this, and, and I, I think the enemy is creeping into people's hearts and creating division. Oh, you, you view this differently than me? Okay, you're now the enemy. Man, that's not the heart of Jesus. It's not the heart of God. We, we can disagree. Uh, we can hold strong to our convictions. I grew up in a home where we'd have lively conversations and disagree, but we didn't hate each other because of it. And now you see anger creeping in. So much anger towards people. Fear. Fear of other people. And, and, and I think the enemy just likes to fuel that fire. Division. I mean, there's so much in our world that wants to divide people into categories and groups, categories and groups. God, God sees two groups of people. God Almighty sees two groups of people. One, people who are lost and broken, who have come to know his grace and they become part of his family. And the second group is this, lost and broken people that have not come to know Jesus and haven't become part of his family yet. That's all that God sees. All of our other categories, God is not concerned about. He, he wants all people to know his love, know his grace, become part of his family, and love one another. That's the heart of God. It's us that make all these categories and divisions that we have to be so, so careful and Satan's lies and work just seem to be multiplying right now. So here's a question. Can you look at yourself and others as children loved by God and in need of grace? When you see a person that may seem scary to you or frustrate you, or you disagree with how they think or how they live or whatever it is, can, can you look and say, God, help me see them as a child loved by God and deeply in need of grace? Because that's what you were when you came to Jesus, if you're a Christian. You are loved by God and in need of grace. You say, but this person, I really disagree, and I really don't like the way they live, and I really don't like the way they think, and I really don't like what they're doing. You say, okay. But can you see them as loved by God and in need of grace? And you know, you can't do this. You're different. I don't like you. Get away from me. And by the way, here's some grace of Jesus. Let me, let me throw it to you from a long distance away. It doesn't work that way. Nicodemus came to Jesus, and Jesus engaged with him. The woman in the well came to the well and Jesus talked with her and interacted with her. That's what Christians do. And we need to say, God, change my heart. Movement four, reclaiming God's good gift. We as God's people, we as a church need to reclaim, say, God, make us like you, the master artist. Jesus, you, you loved, you accepted me, the woman at the well, Nicodemus, Saul. You, you, you accept people right where they're at and then you lead us to where we need to be. God, make me more and more like that. So here's a question for us as a church. If you're part of Shoreline Church, if you're not thinking about your own church right now, how can Shoreline grow as a church that welcomes people from every walk of life, every background, and every culture? How can we become a church that says to people, wherever you are, wherever you come from, you're accepted here? Now, somebody might say, well, does that mean you affirm everything I believe? I say, no. No, we don't. We have a book that guides us, and there's certain things that are right and wrong, and we, and we follow that. But we accept you, and we love you. Well, d d does, that, does that mean that you agree with everything I do? No. Can, you mean you can accept people? And, and this is one of the problems in the world. People are saying, well, if you don't affirm and agree and say everything I do and everything I believe is fine, then you hate me. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. If anybody here has ever raised children, you know you can love someone and disagree with them. If anybody here has ever been married... You know you can love someone and disagree with them. If anybody here's ever, ever, ever had a friendship, you know you can love someone and disagree with them. And so our posture needs to be that of acceptance. 
And so, so let me ask you a few questions just to reflect as, as a church. You know, who do we greet? Who do you greet on a Sunday morning at church? Who do you greet on a Wednesday when we're gathered for a, a mid, midweek uh, service or, or when you interact? With you? Who do you greet? Who do you reach out to? Do you look and say, uh, here's somebody who looks like me? Or do you say, I just want to greet people as people and have a warm welcome? Who do you chat with? Who do you talk with? Who do you spend time with? Who do we befriend? Do we tend to befriend people that are just like me, who think like me, act like me? And you might have even found your life, you say, man, I used to have friends and acquaintances, people I, I hung out with that were a real broad spectrum, but man, it's getting more and more and more and more narrow. That's what the world's doing to us. Say, so as Christians, no. Man, the, the world may grow more and more narrow, but my arms are going to keep getting wider and wider and wider, just like the arms of Jesus. Listen closely. That's not a compromise. We're not saying we agree with what people think. We're not saying we affirm how they live. We're saying we accept people where they are, like Jesus did. And then he was able to lead them to where he wanted them to be. Who do we love like Jesus loved in a way that honors him? And then movement five, the invitation to become an artist. Could you pray today and say, God, let me be more like you, Jesus. The beauty of what you, the beauty of what you painted. I, I challenge you to read, read John chapter three and Jean, read John chapter four, the whole chapter today. And dig into it. And then over the next week, read through those and look at how Jesus loved and interacted and cared. Jesus, make me more like you. Make, help me live like you, love like you, care like you, listen like you listened. And, and if, you re, if you read each of those stories in John 3 and John 4, Jesus disagreed with both of them in the midst of the conversation. Nicodemus, hey, by the way, you need to be born again. This woman, by the way, I've got a way for you to walk and live that's better than how you're living. And both of them came to faith in Jesus. They began where they were with acceptance and then walked with them to where he wanted them to be. That's the love and that's the grace of Jesus. Acceptance of a person does not mean we affirm their lifestyle. We can love people and still disagree with them. We can welcome people in to our hearts, our homes, our lives, our church. I hope and pray that every single person here would say, I any friend I have, anyone I love and care about that, that knows Jesus, that doesn't know Jesus, that's close to Jesus, that's far from Jesus, I would hope you would say, I, I believe if I brought them to Shoreline, they would be accepted right where they are. And God forgive us as a church if we say to anybody, you're only welcome here once you agree with us. The first church that welcomed me in was a youth group at a church in Garden Grove, California. And I came to the youth group because they had a gambling night and there were cute girls. <laughs> that was my motivation. And they opened their arms to this punk surf kid from Huntington Beach. And that was my journey in. If they would have said, cut your hair, straighten up, you know, get your lusty mind in control, you know, go start going to class instead of ditching, and when you get your life together, then you're welcome at our church. I'd have never come. This is what God wants for us. And what could God do through a church in this divided, separated time where people won't accept each other? What could God do through a church of people who say, I will accept you, I will love you right where you are? That's what God wants from us. Last question. What message do we communicate to the world if we can lovingly accept people who are very different than us? What message will that send to a world that isn't functioning that way right now? Man, it's, it's, it, it, has gotten, it has gotten so vicious and nasty and conflicted and divisive. Lord Jesus, don't let us be sucked into that. And Lord, if we've been sucked into that, if we've walked that road, Lord, speak to our hearts today. Turn our eyes, Lord Jesus, to a night when Nicodemus came to you. And you just met him right where he was. Turn our hearts and our minds to a, the hot heat of a day at noon when this lonely, broken woman came and encountered you, Jesus. And you didn't stand separate as a rabbi. You didn't stand separate as a Jewish person and see them as a category of Samaritan. But Lord, you just loved that woman and you brought a revival to Sychar because of a woman who you encountered and just accepted where she was. Turn our hearts and our minds to you on a cross at Calvary, giving your life for us. 
when we were rebels and broken and, and weren't deserving of your acceptance, but Jesus, you knew our thinking was wrong, you knew our lifestyles were tainted, and yet you opened your arms, Jesus, you took the cross, you took the nails, and you gave your life for us. So Lord, this is our prayer for every one of us who's a follower of you, Lord Jesus. Make us more like you. Free us from the fear that if we accept people, they'll think it means that we're approving and agreeing with everything. Free us from that lie and that fear. And help us open our arms, our hearts, our homes, our church to anyone and everyone right where they are, just like you greeted us, Jesus. We pray this in your name, in your power, and for your glory. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give a couple of invitations. First, I want to let you know if you are if you want to know more about Shoreline Church and considering you're considering joining Shoreline Church as a member, I'm teaching a class at 12:30 today in 21 minutes, uh, and it'll be live here on campus in the in the Pacific Room, which is right through the lobby over here, and it will be online at 12:30. You got to go to the website and register right now. You'll get a link. And I've got a big monitor, so I'll have a monitor in the center here. I'll be looking at people on, uh, online here and people in the class here. I'll be teaching t- on, to all of you at the same time. So you can online or here on campus. Join me at 1230 in the Parkside Room. And also, we, I know in this time, it's a crazy time. There's lots of challenges going on. But we're going to keep pressing forward as a church. So we're actually launching some new small groups next month. If you want to jump into a small group, we're also doing two adult classes this next month. And so if you want to know more about classes and small groups, on your way out of the worship center, as you go out through the lobby here, down the stairs on the left, there's a couple of big uh, tent booths there. Go by and talk with those folks. They'll explain about small groups, classes. If you're online, just go to our website, and there's details about those classes and about small groups, and you can get engaged that way. Uh, If you need prayer for anything right now, we've got our prayer folks on both sides of the stage here. Please come forward, ask for God's prayer. Maybe this divisiveness has broken your own heart. Maybe you need God's power to overcome and be more accepting. Come and get prayer following the service. If you're online, our prayer prayer teams are ready to to answer the phone if you call the number that's there and pray with you. Or you can email your prayer needs to the address you see right there. And then we will then respond and and write those down and share those with our prayer team. And then finally, if you're new at Shoreline, uh, if you're on campus, anywhere on campus, campus, be sure you come into the lobby right against that wall over there is our connection center. They want to give you a little gift bag and thank you for coming, answer your questions just help you get to know more about Shoreline Church if you're online just text the word welcome to the number on the screen and we will give you a digital welcome card and do all we can to meet you where you're at online if you're able to stand at home courtyard, family worship venue and the worship venue, stand with me for a closing blessing as we go from here Open your heart to receive this word of blessing. As you go from this place, may you be profoundly, deeply aware that the God of the universe has accepted you right where you are. He may not always affirm what you think and how you see the world. He may not always celebrate how you're living. But his arms are open. He came to this world to show you he loves you and accepts you and wants to lead you where he wants you to be. And as you go from here, will you live like Jesus? Would you have the courage to love and embrace and accept people even when you don't align on everything? Even when you don't align on almost anything? Show the heart of Jesus and let his light shine through you everywhere you go for his glory. Go in his peace, go in his grace, and we'll see you next Sunday as we continue this series on the Forgotten Heart. God bless you. Have a great week.